We spent the majority of the last episode working in the engine bay. This time around, we're pretty much exclusively going to be working underneath the car. And in order to do that, of course, we'll start by jacking the car up. We'll only be lifting the rear end of the car for now, and we want it pretty high in the air. We want it lifted up high, both to make as much room underneath as possible, and because we're going to have to remove the tailpipe at some point, and getting that over the rear axle is going to be a challenge. The main reason we're only lifting the rear of the car is to help all the transmission fluid flow forward so that we can remove the tail shaft without dumping a bunch of it out. Generally speaking, if you can help it, it's not really a good idea to lift a car so unevenly. Before getting underneath, we'll support it with nice big jack stands and chalk the front wheels to make sure it doesn't roll. And once the jack stands are securely in place under the rear frame rails, we'll go ahead and let down the jack. As usual when lifting a vehicle, you'll want to give it a few hard shoves to make sure it isn't going anywhere. And now that the back of the car is off the ground for the first time, we can really examine some of the parts underneath. The fuel and brake lines to the rear are pretty crusty and we're going to have to replace them somewhere down the line. There aren't any signs of leaking just yet, but I'm sure they'll get there at some point. We can also get a better look at the rear sway bar end links. The driver's side bolt is broken and the passenger side one doesn't seem too far behind. We do have new parts and we'll be replacing those soon. Overall, the body of the car is in good shape. This is pretty much the worst spot of rust on the underside. Most of it is pretty clean. I'd really like to clean this up some and apply some rust converter in the near future. There's the usual surface rust on the front end, but nothing too bad. It seems to be in pretty good shape. Even the Y-pipe isn't too rusty. But when looking at it closely, we notice this little line, which could be a crack, it's kind of hard to tell. It's right at the edge of the weld, and looks like it probably is some kind of crack, but it doesn't seem to have been leaking there because there's no soot around it. Since it's fairly accessible, I think once we start working on the exhaust, we'll try welding that up just for kicks. The catalytic converter pipe is pretty rusted too, but in the front at least seems to be kind of holding on. We can see at least one tiny leak, but at this point I don't think it's enough to worry about. However, the pipe behind the cat is a different story. The downpipe is looking a little thin in spots, which is why it seems like it's for the best to just replace the whole thing. We also quickly noticed that one of the four transmission mount bolts is missing, and the nut welded to the body is pretty rusted. We'll also have to do something about that. So what about the transmission tail shaft we keep mentioning? First off, it's leaking a fair amount of fluid here and it leaves little puddles of ATF every time it's driven. Clearly, the rear seal isn't in great shape. It's not difficult to replace that seal with the tail shaft still installed, but the real issue is the rear bushing is looking kind of loose. With that much play in it, it's starting to be a mechanical concern. Also, even if we do replace the seal, it's likely it wouldn't last too long with that much movement. So the plan is to unbolt the tail shaft to remove that bushing and that seal. To start, we'll unbolt the drive shaft. There's a fair amount of grime built up on the bottom of the differential housing, which is probably from the tail shaft seal leaking, but could also be the pinion seal on the diff. Since we know for sure that it's bad, we'll replace the transmission seal first and go from there. The drive shaft is held to the pinion yoke with these four bolts. The impact gun makes short work of them, which isn't surprising since they shouldn't be all that tight. We'll leave one bolt on each side partway installed so that it hangs on to those U-joint straps. To get to the other two bolts, we'll put the transmission in neutral and release the parking brake. Then we can just turn the drive shaft by hand and take care of the other two bolts. Then all we have to do is pry the drive shaft out of the pinion yoke. After a few tries with the pry bar, it was clear that it was pretty stuck. Before getting too rough with it, we threaded in the other strap bolts so at least if it comes loose violently, it can't go too far. It wouldn't be a good idea to torch something like this since there are rubber seals and greased bearings inside of those caps. The pry bar is placed between the threaded end of the pinion and a solid part of the drive shaft. And with one very solid tug, the drive shaft pops loose. Then we'll remove two of the strap bolts, again, so we can completely separate the drive shaft U-joint from the axle. It's a good idea to hold on to it by the two bearing caps just to make sure they don't come loose. And at the other end, all we have to do is slide the drive shaft out of the rear of the transmission. Because of the way the car is tilted, no fluid comes out, but it's still a good idea to have a drain pan underneath it just in case. And with that separated, we can set it aside. The next thing we need to do is remove the electrical connector attached to the tail shaft of the transmission. This year uses an electronic sensor instead of a cable driven speedo. Then we'll try to get this exhaust hanger out of the way. The rubber is in pretty rough shape, so it's a good thing we have a new hanger to install. 
We'll put a jack stand under the exhaust flange to help keep everything supported once the hanger is removed. There's a bolt and a nut holding the hanger to the flange at the back of the cat pipe. Because of the angle, it's just slightly obscured, but trust me, it's there, just like the monster under your bed. However, while it could only ward away that soul-stealing phantasm, this one can be removed with the impact gun. Although the spirit in that rusty fastener couldn't be removed from the socket so easily. Once the bolt is removed from the flange, the hanger is free of the exhaust. Next, we'll remove the nut holding the transmission mount to the cross member. And with that loose, we'll put a board across the transmission pan and lift up on it a bit with the jack. Then we'll impact out the transmission cross member bolts. Eventually, we nudge the camera over so that you can even see us remove one of them. And with those out, the cross member drops free. Now, this isn't necessary in order to remove the tail shaft housing. But we do have a new transmission mount, so we might as well replace that while we're here, and removing the cross member gives us a little bit of extra space. And we'll remove the two bolts that hold the transmission mount to the transmission, and the whole thing comes loose. And with the cross member out of the way, we can lower the transmission down a little bit to have more room to work. We'll also remove the three nuts that are holding the torque arm mount onto the transmission. The rearmost bottom fastener is a stud affixed to the mount bracket, while the other two are bolts and nuts. The lower two also affix that exhaust hanger bracket to the tail shaft housing. I'm sure it would be possible to leave all this affixed to the tail shaft housing, but we're going to be taking it apart anyway, and it makes access to the housing bolts easier. And with that removed, we can separate the exhaust hanger. Then we need to remove the torque arm from that front mount. In hindsight, it would have been easier to just remove the bushing retaining bolt from the bracket and leave the torque arm attached to the axle. But we figured we'd just unbolt the torque arm and slide it out of the rubber mount bushing. To do this, we supported the torque arm with a jack stand and did some excavating to try to locate the mounting bolts that hold it to the differential housing. And once we were able to make a positive identification of the fasteners, we put a wrench on the bolts and used the impact to remove the nut from the bottom. Unfortunately, again, the nut stuck in the socket, so we threaded it back onto the bolt and had to do some persuading to remove it. Then we went ahead and spun off the front one. Then we used the wrench to turn the bolts a little bit and tapped them out. Then with a bit of prying and a bit of hammering, the torque arm came loose. And with the back freed up, we were able to pull and wiggle the torque arm out of that bushing. It took a fair bit of force, so at least the bushing isn't completely shot. And with the torque arm fully removed, we have pretty good access to the tail shaft housing bolts. There's not enough space in the transmission tunnel to actually remove the torque arm bracket, but at least the arm itself is out of the way. We started removing the tail shaft housing bolts by hand, but the threads weren't feeling so good. The bottom two loosened easily, but they're blind holes. There's not enough room to actually remove the bottom left bolt, so we'll just loosen it and leave it in place on the housing. We chalked up the top two bolts being tight as a result of corrosion between the steel and aluminum and decided to just use the impact to spin them out. In hindsight, what I should have done would be to also use a torch to heat up the aluminum that the bolts were threaded into. But the impact removed the bolts effortlessly, so I figured it was okay. We also threaded in the bottom right bolt just to hold everything in place. And once those were out and the camera was repositioned, now we'll just hold the housing up and remove that bolt. With it gone and that bottom left bolt loosened a few more threads, we could slide the whole tail shaft housing off of the output shaft. And with the tail shaft housing off, we can take a look at the bushing that's in the rear of the transmission case. Unfortunately, it's not doing so hot. Having the tail shaft housing bushing go bad certainly didn't help this one out. I bet that's the original bushing that has 150,000 plus miles on it. But while it's not ideal, unfortunately, the only real way to remove that bushing is to gut the transmission. And having just finished a second transmission rebuild on this channel, we're not really looking for an excuse to do a third one. The other unfortunate note is something that probably happened when removing that top right bolt. It took a close look to see it, but there's actually a hairline crack running through that threaded hole. And it's not just present on the outside of the ear, it actually travels down a little bit onto the machined surface. Taking a look at the bolts that we removed, it's fairly clear what happened. Here's the bottom right bolt, threads look perfect, and it came out easily. And here is the top right bolt. 
those last three threads are filled with aluminum. To be honest, I'm not really sure what happened. My best guess is that some of the steel towards the end was eaten away due to corrosion with the aluminum, and it was either the rough surface or some material stuck to the threads of the bolt that spread out the aluminum and caused that crack. So now we have to talk about what we're going to do about it. As with most of the things I do, I assume most of the commenters are not going to be happy about this, but we're going to leave it alone. Yep, I can hear you lighting those torches already. The issue is, this is a difficult thing to fix. The proper solution would be to get an entirely new transmission, or at least a new transmission case, to swap all these parts into. It might be possible to TIG weld the case, but with cast aluminum it's a little iffy, and since the crack travels all the way down to that machine surface, I'm not sure that would be a good idea. Realistically, and optimistically, this will probably never be a problem. The transmission is already pretty high mileage, and judging by that rear bushing, uh, due for a rebuild. It's also not a drag racing car, <coughs> yeah. and the engine makes under 200 horsepower. So we're just gonna cross our fingers and assume that something else is gonna break before this becomes an issue. If it ever would at all. All we're going to do is clean up the threads on that bolt with a die and make sure all the bolts thread into the case easily, and just kind of brush all this under the rug. So, since nothing went wrong and everything is moving along smoothly, let's take a look at the transmission tail shaft housing. With it off of the car, we can take a good look at that rear bushing. To give us a point of comparison, here is the drive shaft installed in the old bushing. Here, the housing is being held still and the drive shaft is wiggled. Maybe an even better illustration is when we hold the drive shaft still and move the tail shaft housing around on it. It's not awful, it might actually be better than the rear transmission bushing, but it certainly isn't ideal. Here's the new bushing we'll be installing into the housing. Before being installed, it seems like it fits pretty similarly to the old bushing, but once in the housing, it'll be compressed a little and fit a bit tighter. The bushing and seal we'll be using are actually leftovers from the 700R4 rebuild we did for the transmission and the blazer. Since that was a four-wheel drive, we didn't need these tail shaft housing parts. We'll go ahead and peel off the old square cut seal, and then we'll use a sharp chisel to knock out the drive shaft seal. It was pretty well stuck in there, but pretty soon the seal relented. And with that out of the way, we'll take a close up look at that bushing. There's clearly some scuffing and wear on it, but nothing too atrocious. And of course, we want to make sure the new bushing matches the old one. The new one isn't dimpled, but it shouldn't be a problem. That's just a slightly different design for keeping the bushing lubricated. It's worth noting that there is a special tool for removing this bushing with the tail shaft installed, I just don't have one. To remove the old bushing, we'll simply use this 30mm socket and a good old fashioned hammer. There's no lip on either side retaining this bushing, so it's fine to push it out and install the new one, however is most convenient. And after a few more taps from the hammer, the bushing pops right out. Then we'll clean up the housing and the new bushing with some brake clean and a paper towel. A scotch bright pad or some very fine sandpaper can also help clean up this surface. In this case, since the surfaces feel completely smooth, it should be okay. Then we'll apply some thread locking compound to the outside of the bushing. Green retaining compound would also be a good choice, but for this is probably a bit overkill. A running joke on this channel is that I always use way too much Loctite, and to be honest, at the time of filming this, I can't remember if I applied that amount as a joke or if I was actually losing my mind. Two or three drops spread around the outside of the bushing would be just fine. To get it started, we're using the backside of this 36mm socket, and then we're going to switch to a large flat washer. We'll basically be hitting the edge of the washer running around in circles to make sure it goes in straight. And once it's about halfway in, we'll give it a few hard taps to get it flush with the surface. Then to move it that last little bit, we'll use the 30mm socket. And once it's about flush with that lower step, it's fully installed. It looked like that 30mm socket was just a bit on the small side for pressing this in, so we sanded just a tiny bit off the outside corner to make sure there weren't any burrs anywhere. Then we'll clean everything up super well to make sure there's no thread locker left and that there are no abrasive particles hanging around. Before test fitting the drive shaft, we'll spray the bushing with a little bit of WD-40 just to make sure it's not completely dry. Then we can carefully mate the two together. It's definitely a tight fit, but everything seems to go together okay. Then we'll repeat the same test as before and see how much wiggle room there is inside of that bushing. It may be difficult to see on camera, but it's a much tighter connection than before. So we'll go ahead and install the new drive shaft seal. Since this one got a reasonable amount of thread locker, I can only assume that I learned my lesson. Though, I'm sure I won't have learned it for long. And just like the bushing, we'll place it on top of the housing and use a washer to hammer it in. We'll keep traveling around the perimeter to make sure everything lies down flat. 
And once it's fully installed, there shouldn't be any gap between the metal of the seal and the housing. So once we give the thread locker some time to dry and give everything another thorough cleaning, we can oil a new square cut seal for the tail shaft housing and install it. And then the tail shaft housing is ready to be reinstalled. And that means we should take a look at these other parts. First up, that exhaust hanger. The whole thing is pretty wobbly, and the rubber is pretty cracked and worn. It has definitely seen better days. And to replace it, here is the new exhaust hanger. The only issue is, this doesn't have the bracket that attaches it to the transmission. The old piece of rubber is held to the bracket with this large rivet. In order to install the new piece, that has to go. To get access to the small side of the rivet, we'll go ahead and cut through the rubber. And once the parts are completely separated, we can hold it down with some OSHA approved footwear and drill out the rivet. A sharp drill bit cuts right through that shoulder, and as soon as that's gone, we can just pull the whole thing apart. So now we can install the transmission mount bracket to our new exhaust hanger. Instead of a big rivet like the factory, we'll just go ahead and use a bolt, a nut, and some washers. But as it turned out, this new exhaust hanger is pretty stiff. We tried to compress it enough in order to use the shorter bolt, but ended up giving up and using a longer one. With this bolt, we were able to install a nut and tighten everything down. The rubber is no match for the clamping force provided by that 5 16 inch bolt. Most likely, it would be fine to leave it there, but we'd like to use the shorter bolt, so we'll go ahead and use locking pliers to hold the rubber against the bracket while we remove that bolt. And once that's removed, we can thread in the shorter bolt, attach the washer, and use a lock nut to hold it in place. Once that seems secure, we'll remove the locking pliers and get the bolt just tight enough that the rubber strap touches the steel bracket beneath the bolt. Our newly attached hanger is much more stiff and will do a better job of holding onto the exhaust. So how about the other rubber parts we've removed? First, we'll take a look at the transmission mount. There is some minor cracking starting in the rubber, but it actually doesn't seem to be in bad shape. Still, since we don't know its age, it's a good idea to replace it, and we might as well since we already have a new one. Before attempting to install anything, we'll compare the new and old and make sure everything seems the same. The designs are a tiny bit different, but I'm sure everything will be okay. And how about that torque arm mount? Like the transmission mount, the rubber seems to be in pretty good shape, although it's not perfect. There is some cracking starting, but the rubber still feels pretty pliable. At this stage, it would have been nice to replace this as well, but honestly it slipped my mind and I didn't order a new one. Luckily, this bushing can be removed while everything is on the car just by removing that one clamping bolt. It would be nice to put in a polyurethane one at some point down the line. Now we're almost ready to start putting things back together, but before we can, I want to sort out that missing transmission crossmember bolt. The front bolt threads in just fine, but as we can see, the back hole is a little rusted out and the bolt drops right in. That's not really going to hold anything in place. In order to get something to thread into there, we'll go ahead and drill it out with a 7 16 drill bit, and we'll tap it for a half inch bolt, mostly because I have a lot of them hanging around. They're not the cleanest threads in the world since the rust actually permeated a little farther than I thought it had, but eventually everything was good enough that we could thread in a grade 8 bolt. Clearly the mount was doing just fine with only 3 bolts holding it in, but I definitely feel better having 4. And now that that's sorted out, we can go ahead and reinstall the tail shaft housing. We had also made sure to clean the mating and sealing surface on the transmission side. We'll install it carefully and make sure we don't let the output shaft scrape up the bushing we just installed. And once it's just about in place, we'll start threading in that bottom left bolt that we weren't able to remove from the housing. We already applied a little bit of anti-seize to this bolt and we'll apply some to the other bolts as we thread them in. Once the bottom left one is finger tight and holding up the housing, we can install the other three. I considered using a bolt and a nut and not using the threads in that upper hole at all, but they felt sturdy enough and I think if it was gonna fail it would fail anyway. Since we cleaned up the bolts, all four of them threaded in by hand with no issues. And with them installed, we'll go around and torque all of them down. The spec for these bolts is 26 foot-pounds. First we'll tighten them to 10 foot-pounds, then we'll go back around and tighten them all down to 20. We're tightening them to a little bit below spec, both because we're using anti-seize which lubricates the threads, and because we want to be as gentle as possible with that upper right bolt hole. There's no way to put a socket on that bottom left bolt, so we'll just tighten it by feel and get it to approximately the same tightness as the other bolts. I'm sure it would be possible to use a crowfoot socket and an extension and something weird to tighten that bolt with a torque wrench, but at that point it's probably not too accurate anyway. Click. And now that we've extracted clicks from all those bolts, we'll reattach the torque arm bracket. Except, whoops, I forgot that bottom bolt doesn't like to come out because of the transmission tunnel. 
Luckily, since the transmission is still hanging off the floor jack, we can just lower it down a little bit more and get that bolt out. Then we can reinstall it along with the exhaust hanger. And then we'll go around and thread together all the nuts and bolts, applying anti-seize to each of the fasteners. Then we'll snug each one down and then torque them all to 30 foot-pounds. Once again, the torque wrench couldn't quite reach the top one, so we'll just go by feel. Now we'll also go ahead and reconnect the vehicle speed sensor. And we'll bolt up our new transmission mount. These bolts have anti-seize and we'll just get them both hand tight. The mount has adjustment slots in it, so we'll make sure everything is where it needs to be before we tighten those down. Now we can lift back up the transmission cross member and bolt it into place. And once all four bolts are installed, including our new one, we'll snug those all down, then install the nut and washer onto the transmission mount. And now that we're sure everything seems to be fitting correctly, we'll torque down the cross member bolts to 40 foot-pounds. We'll slide the transmission mount until it feels like it's pretty much centered, then we'll lower the jack and drop the transmission back onto the cross member. And using the slots in the cross member, we'll tighten the transmission mount bolts to 18 foot-pounds. Then the transmission mount to cross member nut to 25 foot-pounds. And next, we have to get the torque arm reinstalled. With a little bit of soapy water and a lot of pressure, it installs easily into that front mount bushing. Then we just need to slot it back into place on the differential housing. Once we line it up by hand, we can tap it into place with the mallet. Then we'll give it a few tugs with a big screwdriver to get the bolt holes aligned just right. Then we can drop in the bolts and give them a few encouraging taps to get them all the way through and we'll reinstall the washers and nuts and get everything tightened down. The torque spec for these bolts is 100 foot-pounds, so hold on to something. To keep the bolts from turning while tightening these, we had a wrench on the bolt head and it got pretty stuck. So make sure you get that loose before you try to torque the next one. And with the bolts tight, and once again the wrench rescued, we're ready to reinstall the drive shaft. We'll apply some transmission fluid directly to the seal as well as the sealing surface on the drive shaft. Of course, we also want to make sure that it's clean. And once the drive shaft has been carefully slid back into the transmission, we'll also line up the rear U-joint. We'll make sure the bearing caps are completely seated in the yoke and then reattach the straps. We also took this opportunity to apply some anti-seize to the strap bolts. Once all four are finger tight and we're sure that the U-joint is where it needs to be in the yoke, we can tighten down all four bolts to 16 foot-pounds. One way to hold the drive shaft still while tightening these is, of course, to apply the parking brake. But if you're too lazy to get up and do that, you can also put a screwdriver or a pry bar through the joint and just hold it still like that. Now that most of the stuff we took apart has been put back together, I think we'll go ahead and end the episode here. We didn't quite get to the exhaust this time around, so we'll deal with that and the sway bar end links in the next episode. The work we did this time has left me with mixed feelings. Even though there definitely aren't any cracks in the transmission, it still has me a little bit worried, and I kinda wonder if it would have been better off if I never touched it at all. But weird issues and unexpected drama is all part of working on cars. We'll just have to keep our fingers crossed that everything will be okay and keep dealing with problems as they arise. 